Last but not least, <laughs> Pam Baldinger, USAID. Okay, Doug. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, what, a, what a crew. I, I really appreciate everyone um, turning out this morning uh, to hear about this, this program. Um, you know, it's, um, it's always interesting uh, when you live on the West Coast, Sometimes you're a little more detached from what's going on in Washington, D.C., but one can't help to notice that the rhetoric toward China of late has been rather blustery. And uh, many seem to be uh, discovering for the first time uh, Winston Churchill's statement that China is an enigma wrapped in a mystery. And um, this is something that I've been beating my head against for, for 22 years since, like Jennifer, teaching uh, at Zhejiang Dashe in, uh, in Hangzhou, and uh, starting in 83 for a couple of years, um, when uh, my students were all involved in energy engineering, and so I became very interested in that, and um, gradually was able to get this, this program underway. Um, so I'll begin today with an overview of the energy picture. I know that there are many experts in this room, so at the end of these remarks, I'm mostly interested in hearing, hearing from all of you and your comments and insights. Um, so we'll discuss uh, China's energy issues affecting global markets, um, and then uh, dig into some of the things the China Sustainable Energy Program has been supporting. Uh, in China. Michael then will jump in and talk about China's transportation sector, uh, some of the work that he's been doing for the program um, and, and the developments underway there. First is some background. This is a partnership of three foundations. Uh, the Energy Foundation, where I work, is the manager of this program. Its funding comes from the David and Lucille Packard Foundation and the William and, and Flora Hewlett Foundation. We, we move $8 million per year, uh, and we're moving into our uh, eighth year. Why we focus on energy, everybody already knows this, but um, how energy is produced and consumed is one of the greatest challenges and most intractable problems facing our civilization. Uh, it causes four-fifths of the emissions implicated in global warming, nearly all the urban smog, nearly all the acid rain, more than half of the nuclear waste, and much of the airborne toxics. We cannot solve these challenges without addressing the energy question. Uh, obviously, energy is also a central underlying factor uh, in the world's strategic political and economic interests. And uh, that's, uh, of course, behind much of the cacophony on the world stage about China today. One of the things we're most interested in, of course, is the global warming picture. Um, depending on which models you look at, China may well catch up with US, the US uh, carbon emissions by 2025. Um, and again, we cannot solve global warming without addressing China's uh, carbon emissions. Come on. All right. Also, the U.S. Well, we we got a little enthusiastic there. Okay. Um, another reason why we should care about China's fossil emissions um, are that those emissions are landing on the U.S. Um, and getting emissions reductions in U.S. ambient. Uh, air quality may be cheaper in some cases by investing in China. Uh, the map in the center shows the prevailing conveyor, Trans-Pacific conveyor. Um, Chinese particulates, uh, Chinese sulfur emissions are depositing in U on U.S. soils, in U.S. water supplies, uh, in Maine forests. Um, and the main, main concern here, obviously, and, and this concern uh, reaches to our own coal emissions, which we, we get 60% of our electricity from coal in the United States, is, of course, mercury. A potent neurotoxin enters the food supply. Uh, it's particularly damaging to uh, fetuses and children uh, and, and damages IQ. Um, so we cannot solve this problem without addressing coal emissions. China is the most coal-dependent economy on Earth. Um, and as the world's now second largest energy consumer behind the U.S., two-thirds of all of that energy comes from coal. Last year, China surpassed two billion metric tons of coal. This is twice the volume as the United States. Eighty percent of all China's electricity comes from coal. Um, 
And the current pace and scale of development has China's uh, carbon emissions then more than doubling over the next 15 years. They could well mm -hmm. triple at, at the current pace of, of um, energy production. Michael will talk more about uh, China's growing oil dependence. Uh, oil demand is surging um, in only 12 years since it was really a net exporter in up to 93. Uh, it's now become the, the second largest oil consumer on Earth. Uh, it's now consuming 6.3 million barrels of oil per day, which is about one-third U.S. levels. Uh, oil demand is climbing really because of the breakneck pace of economic growth uh, and the oil consuming heavy industries. Um, and also, of course, China's consumers are rapidly buying cars. So this is what China's energy mix looks like. Uh, you can see here how coal and oil really predominate. China has a long way to go if to diversify its energy base. Um, obviously, main options include natural gas, currently only 3% of China's energy mix. China has um, very ambitious plans to expand natural gas to 8% by 2010 and is accelerating a national network of pipelines. Um, Jeff Logan knows well how they've completed now this, uh, the east-west pipeline from Xinjiang out to, to Shanghai, which started operation last year. And China is preparing now really to import uh, liquefied natural gas and is building LNG terminals along the Guangdong coast. Um, and they anticipate that imports will be 40 percent of gas demand by 2025. Again, Jeff's a great expert on this. So follow-up questions on natural gas could, could go to him. Nuclear power, there, China has plans to quadruple their nuclear power stations over the next 15 years. Could add as many as 24 to 32 nuclear pl plants by 2020. Um, there's much more that could be said about nuclear. So the, overall, the energy growth has really just been explosive over the last really three years, with GDP averaging now 9% every year for 25 years, which is just the most remarkable stretch of growth really in the history of humankind. Um, energy is growing at over 10%, electricity at over 15%, coal up 20% year on year, oil up 18% year on year. Uh, it's just staggering. Um, on the right, you see a chart that um, is a project that we funded that. Um, became China's National Energy Plan, approved by the State Council, um, which developed scenarios for energy um, consumption in 2020 uh, and had a high growth scenario, a business as usual scenario, and then a low growth scenario that looked at what more aggressive efficiency and renewables policies could be adopted in the near term. China's just way off track. They're well in excess today of the, even the high growth um, scenario. So, Although, you know, and there's electricity shortages in 24 provinces, breakneck pace of uh, construction of new power plants, on average about 1,000 megawatts a week. You know, this is another California's electricity infrastructure every year. And they've been doing this for the last three years. Um, there's, a, there's a sense among the senior, senior leadership that energy growth is out of control. Uh, many of the power plants that are being constructed are unauthorized by the National Development Reform Commission. Local uh, officials with a, uh, a priority on economic growth, building plants without authorization. Um, and this is leading to what the Energy Research Institute under NDRC is describing as a boom-bust cycle. They, they, they state that by 2007, supply will come into balance with demand. Uh, but already we see much of the foreign direct investment in the energy sector already in, in capital flight. The reasons, again, for this uh, breakneck growth in the energy infrastructure is China's becoming the factory of the world. Uh, and much of the economic output comes from the most energy intensive of industries. China has 4% of the global GDP and yet consumes 40% of the coal, half of all cement, a third of all iron, a quarter of all steel. And it's these most energy intensive uh, industries that are, are pulling so much of this uh, energy. Um, 
And whereas the U.S. is about a two-thirds service economy, China is a two-thirds heavy industrial society. Uh, there's a debate underway among the senior leadership about whether China is taking the, the wrong development path. Should China be much more service economy focused? Um, and a lot of this comes down to a key issue that uh, is, you know, the thesis of this discussion today. China's overall energy insecurity. It wants to use its own domestic resources <coughs> as much as it can. Um, and, it's, and it has so much coal and it can fuel these heavy industries. And so it's taking a heavy industrial development path really out of energy insecurity. Of course, the human costs of this path are staggering. Um, cars and coal are really the <coughs> fundamental to the deteriorating ambient air quality in, in all major cities in China, 16 of 20 most air polluted cities in the world <coughs> in China. Uh, the World Bank, as you all know, has estimated that these environmental costs are up to 8% of uh, annual GDP. Um, respiratory and heart diseases from polluted, from polluted air are killing half a million people every year, 75 million asthma attacks. By any definition, this is a profound health crisis ongoing in China due to the dependence on fossil fuels. The solution is development of advanced, more energy efficient technologies and shifting toward renewable energy. Um, and our, our program is attempting to help send the central government and provincial and local governments with the initial steps of moving energy efficiency policies into place in order to attract private investment into these uh, more advanced technologies. Countries that lead in the development of these technologies, of course, will be the main economies of the 21st century. Um, and those that fail to innovate in, these, in this area will fall behind. Half a trillion dollars in the United States alone moves around the electricity wires every year. As, that, as those technologies shift toward cleaner technologies, that's, that's a lot of money to be made, and that's a lot of innovation. But being out in front of that curve will, will become ultimately the main economic players of this century. Now China has a long way to go in getting e efficiency and renewables technologies into place. Um, the vast bulk of China's current energy investments are locking in investments in more antiquated technologies. Much of these coal plants are still Eisenhower era. Um, and so and once they build them, they'll be pumping air, you know, these pollutants into the atmosphere for a generation or more. Um, but China's new energy investments are cleaner, but nowhere near where they could be. You know, they're still about six times less efficient than the average Japanese new energy technologies and two and a quarter times less efficient than the newer uh, U.S. energy technologies. China's leaders have set very aggressive economic development goals for 2020. Uh, in 2003, uh, Hu Jintao announced that there will be three more Chinas the size of today's by 2020. He also embarked on what he calls the three transcendencies. Uh, first, to transcend uh, the old resource wasteful technology, maximize a recycling economy, uh, and move toward sustainable development including optimizing uh, sustainable energy technologies. Second, transcend the traditional ways for great powers to emerge on the world, world stage. Reject hegemony uh, and pursue a peaceful ascendancy. Uh, I think this is uh, where there's a lot of tension right now around China's uh, recent oil supply deals and so on, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And third, transcend outmoded approaches to social control, uh, introduce the rule of law, and then build, of course, the harmonious socialist society. This is the story of really the 21st century. You see China on the bottom in red. The U.S. is in blue. Um, China's, uh, the, China's, uh, the, the 21st century really will be a story of three economies, the U.S., China, and India. 
Uh, China's economy is likely to grow sevenfold by mid-century and could well surpass the scale of the U.S. economy by then. And really the greatest challenge is how the United States will adapt to the inevitable emergence of China and India on the world stage. Putting China into perspective, you guys all know all this, so I'll blow through it quickly. Um, China's population is five times that of the U.S. Its workforce will likely be five to six times larger than the U.S. by 2030. Um, and already in the last decade, China's uh, workforce has increased the global workforce by half. The U.S., 4% of the global population, consumes 25% of uh, the fossil fuels and oil in particular, China, 20% of the world's population consuming 8%, a third of the U.S. levels. Per capita uh, GDP, China is one-eighth that of the U.S. Still in per capita terms, China's economy, China, the Chinese are ranked 100th in the world today. Energy consumption per capita, China again about one-eighth that of the United States. If every Chinese were to consume the same amount of energy per capita as your average American, global carbon dioxide emissions today would be 122% greater. Now already with really troubling signs of, uh, or evidence of global warming manifesting themselves on, in, on every continent and even the most aggressive or even the most conservative climate models um, over recent years, these, the signs are, are, are surpassing those. Um, there's, there's much to be concerned about with China's rise in dependence on fossil fuel. Now the best way to, to help China attain sustainable development, the first transcendency, um, is to address its most available, its cheapest, uh, its most rapid to mobilize energy resource, which is its energy waste. To generate every dollar of GDP in China, um, China uses five times more energy than the United States and 12 times more energy than Japan. But China has been focusing less on saving energy and more on supply, obtaining supply. Uh, their leaders are desperately trying to uh, prevent energy from becoming a bottleneck to economic growth. And so there's been breakneck push for uh, obtaining supply. Um, two billion tons of coal, as I mentioned. It can't be mined or transported fast enough, so it's becoming a bottleneck, and thus the shift toward importing coal from, from Australia and Philippines and other places. Uh, still plagued with energy shortages in 24 provinces. And trying to build their way out of this, rather than take those same dollars and invest in less energy consuming technologies. China's embarked on a major global quest to obtain oil. Um, and this has been a marriage of China's oil majors, uh, the three companies, Sinopec, PetroChina, and Sinook, along with statesmanship. Um, there's been a full court press to diversify the geography of oil supply contracts, um, which is a classical portfolio, prudent portfolio approach uh, to oil supply. Um, but they're also trying to hedge against choke points in the, the, the transportation of oil, particularly through um, the, the Strait of Malacca and, and the Taiwan Straits. Uh, so we've seen the, the deals now with Kazakhstan and a potential um, pipeline uh, out to, to Kazakhstan. Now the central government's been working in tandem with these three oil companies, uh, courting oil producing countries and offering uh, favorable trade deals, aid, uh, construction of bridges, harbors, roads, um, forgiving national debt, and so on. And problematically, uh, China's been entering deals with what the United States uh, considers rogue nations, um, including Iran, Burma, Sudan. Um, and this has not endeared China to the U.S. government. Uh, so. According to the U.S. government, China appears to be trying to actively undermine U.S. efforts to isolate these regimes and get them to comply with international norms, laws, uh, and standards. 
And it's important to note, though, that China is doing this out of this sense of vulnerability to energy supply. They're now 45% dependent on foreign oil, uh, foreign oil imports. And they're also worried that the U.S. could cut off these uh, oil supplies uh, through its naval, um, its Navy's position in, in protecting the, the Straits of Malacca and, and so on. So they're worried about the U.S. We're worried about each other. <laughs> now, U.S. analysts have been arguing that this shows a rise of energy nationalism in China rather than cooperation with the U.S. and OECD countries. Uh, these supply contracts have been locking up future oil supplies. That means less oil available to the United States uh, in the future. Um, instead of China entering more cooperative arrangements, joining things like the IEA's uh, 26 country oil reserve program, uh, where all countries contribute to reserve reserves and, and create buffers on uh, global price spikes together. Um, so we have this choice. Either China's uh, needed supply creates uh, added tension, or leads to added tensions, or it's an opportunity to develop greater cooperation. Um, in the spirit of cooperation, I offer here, you know, invite China's participation in the G8, uh, as well as the IEA Joint Oil Initiative, initiative uh, Reserves Initiative, and obviously actively help China reduce its energy demand. How that would look. Um, all nations have to address this kind of chart. Ultimately, reduce oil growth, oil demand, through energy efficiency investment. Uh, ramp up investment in renewable energy, and ultimately squeeze down that middle area of fossil fuel over time. This chart is eminently feasible. Uh, it's already, there's already well demonstrated public policies uh, that can achieve this kind of chart. Uh, and it's mobilizing already available technologies. Uh, government must lead this process. It, China's new to a market economy. My conversations with central, the central government leaders, they're talking about how do we do this? How do you manage a market economy? How do you, uh, you know, what is the government role in developing policies and laws that will channel private investment toward technologies? And, and do we use, how do we use the tax code? How do we use um, various fiscal policy incentives and so on? Another point that we all need to remember is China has gutted its government. This is one of the, Zhu Rongji left many wonderful legacies, but one of the problems has been, first he cut the scale of the government in half, laying off all of those workers, and then he cut it in half again. SIPA, the Environmental Protection Administration, has 200 people in it. How many work at EPA? You know, 5,000 or something? You know, even the city of, of Seattle in its municipal planning department has 200 people. I mean, and this is like an order of magnitude more than what the, you know, the, the um, you know, Ministry of, of um, Construction has available for building codes. So it's, um, what, what China really needs to do is, and what the Ministry of Finance needs to do is fund a, a significant expansion in personnel and you know, the United States should be actively involved in helping to train that personnel in how to, to work uh, and manage a, uh, a market economy. Um, so uh, intervening in markets, um, government would, first, it's most important to have, you know, airtight uh, regulations. Um, and then secondly, and, and that's the basis on which you can build market mechanisms, other incentive <coughs> policies. Uh, Ruth Greenspan, Greenspan Bell, who I believe is here today. Um, okay, just walked in. Just walked in. Great. Hi, Ruth. Um, knows well the importance of prerequisite of a strong regulatory infrastructure uh, prior to then moving toward market mechanisms like SO2 permit trading and so on. So the first priority is to help SEPA um, and really structural reform for SEPA. Um, this slide shows what can be done through um, efficiency and renewables policies. Wind energy in the United States was over 20 cents a kilowatt hour in the late 80s. It's now down to you know, 4 cents a kilowatt hour. It's the cheapest form of new electricity in wind-rich areas. 
China is following this curve in mobilizing um, renewable energy currently. And China is, uh, you know, moving to implement energy demand reductions. Uh, interestingly, its current energy intensity improvement targets are four times that of the Bush administration's Clear Sky initiative. Um, it's adopting fuel economy standards, which Michael will be talking about, appliance efficiency standards, industrial efficiency practices, renewable energy targets, and so on, which I'll get to in a moment. But China's struggling. You know, it's, uh, these gains are rapidly being ups outstripped by the sheer pace and scale of its economic growth. Um, but this graph shows that China was successful during the four modernizations of 1980 through 2000 when it quadrupled its GDP but grew its energy infrastructure by half. Most countries grow energy and GDP in lockstep, but China was able to do it at half that rate. China would like to do that again. But here's the problem. Its energy efficiency investment has been dropping. Energy efficiency investment peaked in 1983. It's now one-third those levels today. And as a result, China's flipped the historic trend. Energy is now growing at 1.8 times uh, the um, overall economy. So I'd like to talk now a little bit about uh, the basket of policies in each of these sectors uh, that spurs commercialization of clean energy technology. And uh, these are the program areas of our uh, China Sustainable Energy Program. We have a Beijing office. Uh, I encourage you all to visit it at some point. Um, a, dozen, a dozen native Chinese, all um, energy experts in their own right. They serve as a bridge between China's energy policy makers and international energy policy experts who come to China and engage in training, capacity building, and help China as it develops its uh, energy regulations. We have a, both a top-down and a bottom-up approach. Uh, we work with the central government and these, uh, these main ministries um, to develop regulations, policies. And then we, um, we have, it, with our top-down um, effort, a senior policy advisory council. Um, this is a group of uh, ministers who um, provide advice to the program, uh, policy guidance to the program. Um, and we match these folks with, their, with some international counterparts who are energy experts uh, in their own right. And we have an annual meeting this year. We'll be focused with uh, bringing out the Ministry of Finance to talk about uh, the need for tax and fiscal policies and the capacity building of government in general. Um, we also then have a bottom-up approach. Once the central government approves uh, policies, um, we work then in the provinces to demonstrate those, um, those uh, policies. And these have been more successful than I would have anticipated. It's very hard to work at the provincial level uh, because the, just the regulatory infrastructure is much less advanced uh, and the rule of law is much less advanced. Yet being in the spotlight of Beijing has each of these pilots, the local officials, the local mayors have risen to the occasion and are developing or, or delivering <laughs> carbon emissions reductions much faster than we would have anticipated. Uh, our buildings and appliance program focuses on appliance standards um, and labeling in, in these main appliances and also building codes. Now the appliance standards, and this has been a partnership with US EPA uh, and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, um, is focused on refrigeration, air conditioning, and the, the new lighting clothes washer and TV standards are displacing the need for 34 large 1,000 megawatt power plants by 2020. And four of the new standards, that includes air conditioning, um, will lobby 9% you know, of all residential electricity by the end of this decade. Um, so we're, we're, we're pleased about this still. The, the challenge is, is making sure all of the manufacturers are actually producing uh, appliances in compliance with these standards. And that's a, a big unknown. We're, we're trying to dig into getting better data around that. But as you all well know, data is, is a challenge. Building codes. This is also an area where, you know, we were skeptical uh, eight years ago. 
Um, but the Ministry of Construction has really risen to the occasion. They're now residential, uh, state-of-the-art residential and commercial building codes uh, for the nation. This is very important because in each of the last 15 years, China has built over 80,000 sky-rise buildings in each of those years. Um, and they plan on increasing the building stock another 50% over the next decade. I mean, it's just a, the, the most staggering building boom in the history of humankind. Um, and almost none of these buildings so far have been built to the standards of a modern energy code. Um, but we have half a dozen pilots underway, um, and those, those, those are showing some results, getting the administrative practices in place with the design institutes to monitor construction throughout and require compliance with the building, uh, with an energy code. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can't open the building. In industry, uh, we focus on equipment standards. Uh, half of all China's electricity is consumed in electric motors. Uh, making those more efficient um, is, is critical for uh, car China's carbon reductions. And one of the more interesting areas really has been bringing in European sector targets for, for large industrial enterprises. China's now launching a 1,000 enterprises program targeting the most energy consumptive um, factories f for energy efficiency improvement and they're modeling this on the sector targets program that um, we funded in, in Shandong province, two steel, steel mills there that have both met their energy efficiency improvement targets um, ahead of schedule um, with significant carbon reductions. So that will be expanding. Uh, in the electric power sector we're focused on uh, utility regulatory f reform. Um, Eight years ago, we began working with the World Bank on uh, helping to develop a new electricity regulatory commission. And the State Council then approved the State Electricity Regulatory Commission, which is similar to our FERC. Um, that entity still does not have pricing authority, which is critical, uh, but we're, we're hopeful that that comes soon, wresting it from the National Development Reform Commission. Um, and the main, the, the main mission of this energy entity would be to regulate electric utilities so that energy efficiency investment is as profitable as building new power plants. And also to, to promote an integrated resource planning, any siting of new plants would have to be the least cost resource. And the analysis around that obviously will move a great deal more investment toward energy efficiency. One of the promising initiatives, really, Barbara Finnamore has been uh, managing uh, with the Nat Natural Resources Defense Council and working with her partners in the Demand Management, Demand Side Management Center in uh, Jiangsu <coughs> Province and in Shanghai and in Beijing to develop energy efficiency power plants. And the Asia Development Bank is now interested in this. And what this is is financing the development of, in, on the same kinds of terms as a new power plant. Instead, take that money and invest in new energy saving technology, more efficient lighting, motors, refrigeration, air conditioning, and so on. And within the service area of a utility, by investing in those technologies, you find that you can save energy more cheaply, more rapidly. Um, than you can to construct it. Uh, and this is a promising new, new effort underway, and so I commend Barbara uh, to you if you have questions about this. Um, with luck, this could be a national trend. Another area uh, that also N NRDC has been a champion, champion of, and um, now Stanford University, Lynn Orr and his group um, have been promoting, and also John Holdren up at, at Harvard, uh, and so on, and, 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 and Bob Williams at Princeton, Integra integrated gasification combined cycle for coal. You know, China has an 80-year supply of coal, and again, with their energy insecurity, they're going to use it in the United States as well. I mean, we have a lot of coal. What's clear, th this is, a, you gasify coal, um, it's where the chemical industry and the electricity industry comes together, uh, because by gasifying coal, there are a lot of industrial um, uh, chemical applications, but you also generate electricity. The key here and the most important element for the environmental community is capturing the carbon and sequestering it geologically, which is largely untested, but it's been proven in oil recovery, enhanced oil recovery, and so on. 
Uh, the Chinese are very interested in this, but they're sitting on their hands because they want to see the United States lead. Renewable energy is ramping up quickly in China, and this is an area, again, that we were skeptical five years ago, I mean, or eight years ago. You know, renewable energy at that time was under the Agriculture Ministry. Now it's front and center at the National <laughs> Development Reform Commission. Um, we've been working on mandatory market share policies, renewable portfolio standards by any other name, um, small wires charges, you pool those funds for investment and efficiency programs and renewable energy. Um, Wind concession programs, Joanna Lewis is uh, a great expert at, at this, uh, as well as distributed generation, um, you know, off-site, you know, it's off-grid applications and also in congestion centers. China, faster than anyone could have anticipated, has adopted a new renewable energy law, it's adopted last April, and our, our grantees were very active in the initial analysis around this and now are very active in the implementation regulations that the National Development Reform Commission is developing around it. The renewable energy law requires 10% of all electricity in China to come from renewables by 2020. Now, in the recent Energy, energy Act in the United States, we had in it a renewable portfolio standard that would have required half the amount of renewable energy that is now national law in China, but the renewable portfolio standard in our legislation was stripped out. China will be tw developing 120 gigawatts of, uh, of renewable energy, and just wind alone, this is about a $20 billion market. How they're ramping up the wind market is through wind concessions, and our grantees have been active in the legal documents for auctioning wind rights uh, to private developers. And right now there's 1,100 megawatts of wind under construction. Uh, so over a billion dollars of new wind resources under development. And there'll be about another 3,000 megawatts going out to con for contract um, over the next couple of years for completion by um, 2010. And I showed you what that looks like going out to 2020, 20 gigawatts of wind. So clearly China wants to be a player in renewable energy technology development uh, and is making great inroads on bringing down the unit costs of renewable energy through volume. I'd like to turn now to, to Michael to talk about uh, the developments in the uh, transportation sector and um, we're going to change chair. <laughs> Thank you, Doug, for the, uh, your over broad overview of the uh, energy situation in China and uh, what Energy Foundation is doing. Uh, let me briefly mention your, what I am doing. I am uh, a researcher at Argonne National Lab, so my full-time at the daytime job is at Argonne National Lab to do research in transportation fuels and adv advanced vehicle technologies. And uh, the, you know, in the last uh, several years since actually since 2000, I uh, you know, participate uh, the China program, the Energy Foundation's China program, specifically in the transportation area. Uh, so ge geographically, Argon is located in suburban of Chicago, so we're in Midwest. Uh, and uh, Doug mentioned his di disadvantage in the uh, West Coast. Uh, and in Midwest, uh, we even have a bigger disadvantage. <laughs> we do not have the, uh, the uh, we do not have the uh, geographic location to catch the fashionable culture trends in West Coast. Uh, <laughs> and we, on the other hand, we do not have the advantage to understand the political front uh, in East Coast. Uh, so where is your stuck in the middle? But anyway, seriously, back to. Uh, my your uh, talk in the transportation area. As you see from this chart, uh, the, curr the current uh, oil consumption in China is about six million barrels a day. As that uh, relative to the U.S. Uh, 18 or 19 million barrels, uh, barrels a day oil consumption. Proje projections show that uh, by 2020, 20, 20, 25, the Chinese oil consumption can reach uh, 
12 million barrels out there. Uh, some, uh, some projections even predict uh, the oil consumption in China could reach uh, 25 million barrels per day. 12 or 25 is a big number for the next, uh, 20, for the next uh, 20 years. On the other hand, India is catch up uh, you know, fast. So we will have uh, you know, two new major players coming into the oil market. And uh, you know, increasingly, your know, overall still protein growth area still provide about 50% of the total oil supply worldwide. And uh, that will continue to be the case. So the you know, U.S. will run out on um, you know, the Midwest, uh, Mid-East oil. China will run out on um, Mid-East mid oil. This is a chart to show you the historical trend of the Chinese vehicle population growth. As you can see, over the last uh, you know, 20 or so years, the Chinese vehicle population grows <laughs> dramatically. As of now, the Chinese pop uh, vehicle population is about 15 million vehicles. This is only it's, uh, motor vehicles, does not include motorcycles, the uh, so-called rural vehicles. As relative to the U.S. Uh, 230 million vehicles, so right now the Chinese vehicle population is only about 6% uh, of the U.S. vehicle population. But uh, on the other hand, as you see, the, the growth has been very fast. The uh, sales has been growing about 30 to 35% a year in the last uh, several years. And in two, for example, in 2003, the vehicle sales, or especially passenger car sales in Beijing, was 80% growth over 2002. Uh, in 2004, even the growth reduced to 30%, a large reduction from 80% to 30% are year to year growth, but 30% is still a big number. So, China became a third largest auto market in the world since last year. Uh, look, compared with other countries, the Chinese vehicle growth is only at its beginning. So here, this shows the uh, vehicle ownership per thousand people in uh, some, uh, some major countries. As you see, you know, as of now, the vehicle ownership in China is only 22, and the uh, U.S. Uh, vehicle ownership is above 700. So, this shows there's a large potential to grow, to grow in the future in the Chinese vehicle market. This chart shows the projection of vehicle growth into the future in the Chinese market. As you can see, primarily based on your several major studies, you know, they all show fast growing vehicle populations into the future. You know, all the way to 2030, so by 2030, the Chinese vehicle population could exceed 100 million vehicles. And of course, you know, that will still be you know, less than half of the U.S. vehicle population, but that itself is a large number. And the, the most uh, conservative vehicle growth projection by National Academy, Academy of Science, as you see the bottom line, that's your know, with the managed growth scenario. So you're under some management uh, to manage the growth, you know, the, the vehicle population could, could grow at that level. So it's not uh, realistic, it's uh, under some policies to restrict uh, vehicle growth. So overall, you see the large growth into the future. This is uh, a chart to show growth in uh, traffic. So here, this chart shows two factors. One is total vehicle population growth. The other is VFT per vehicle growth. So those two factors together to show in this chart for passenger cars, they're in the, they are the red bars here in this chart. They are in passenger kilometer per year. And the freight, freight traffic volume is in tons per, per tons kilometer per year. So as you can see, in both cases, growth will be fast. So now, you know, as we think about uh, the e effects on energy and emissions, this is the key. You know, the, you know, the total travel 
you know, including the per vehicle travel and the total vehicle growth. And more importantly, as you see, the growth in passenger transportation is much faster than in freight transportation. So this poses us, us a policy question. How do we manage the, the, uh, the traffic growth? So we have two fronts we have to cover. One is vehicle growth, the other is vehicle usage. This chart show you the uh, Chinese oil import from different regions. And not surprisingly, China renounced heavily on Middle e East oil as, as, US, you know, as, as the U.S. case. Of course, the U.S. renounced less on Middle East uh, than China, and the U.S. renounced uh, you know, some import from Central America and some other regions. This is a chart to show the oil growth in the next uh, you know, 25 years. As you can see, based on the EIA projection, the U.S. oil in use will continue to increase under the business as usual case. So by By 2030, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. not duty vehicle fleet uh, oil use will grow from the 2,009 million barrels per day to about 18 million barrels a day. So we, uh, if we go with business new, as usual scenario, we'll double our oil use in the not duty fleet. On the other hand, the Chinese oil growth will go to about 12 million barrels a day by 2030. Uh, this again under the business as usual case for the Chinese uh, last duty fleet. But on the other hand, if we, you know, if we have energy conservation policies in place, China can reduce the oil use in last duty fleet by half to reduce the last duty oil use to about uh, 6 million barrels a day. So energy conservation has a large effect on the Chinese fleet. Uh, this is uh, because the Chinese fleet growth is uh, primarily the new vehicle growth. So if we have a policy to reduce uh, the new vehicle energy use, will have a larger effect because the, the you know, large amount of new vehicles added to, uh, to the fleet uh, every year. So, Doug talk about uh, the energy foundation's uh, strategy and uh, approaches in, uh, in China in, in the energy conservation area. In the transportation area, the, chi the China Sustainable Energy Program of Energy Foundation takes the, these six approaches. First, uh, we uh, target fuel economy status for vehicles. And second, vehicle emission status primarily targets urban urban air pollutant uh, to deal with uh, urban air pollution problems. The third area is we promote clean conventional fuels, such as north sulfur, gasoline, and diesel. The fourth area is we promote alternative fuels, the fuels produced uh, from uh, sources other than oil in order to reduce uh, Chinese transportation oil consumption. The fifth area is uh, we have programs, we have uh, you know, collaborations with uh, different government agencies to promote advanced vehicle technologies, such as hybrid electric vehicles, fuel cell, fuel cell vehicle research and development effort, and battery-powered EVs. And in China, there's still, there's still a, a large effort in uh, promoting battery-powered EVs. And in fact, uh, because the advancement uh, in battery technologies in the last uh, several years, unique major hydride battery and the lithium iron battery technologies, now it seems the battery powered electric vehicles has a uh, uh, potential to get into the transportation market again. And in the, uh, in the transportation system area, you know, in order to reduce the vehicle usage, we promote bus rapid transit system, namely BRT. This is a chart to summarize uh, the current uh, situation of Chinese vehicle fuel consumption relative to the U.S. vehicle fuel consumption and uh, the 
fuel consumption status in Japan and in Europe. Relative to you know, for China and the U.S., both parts show the current uh, situation. As you can see, the Chinese fuel consumption level, this is liters per 100 kilometer. The Chinese fuel consumption is comparable to the U.S. fuel consumption, you know, current to current. Uh, this take into account the Chinese vehicles are relatively speak much smaller than the U.S. vehicles on average. Yes. But does the U.S. CAFE number that you have there include um, small trucks and SUVs? Uh, this is uh, the 27, tw 27 and a half mile per gallon. This is only for passenger cars, not duties. No, no SUVs included? No SUVs included in this part. About 30% of our fleet now? And <laughs> right, uh, the new vehicles are above 50%. So, mm -hmm. so with the SUVs, yeah. that would be right. yes. much higher? Yeah. Okay. Yes, and uh, you know, later on I'll show the, you know, the composition of uh, the vehicle mix is between the two markets. But uh, the, you know, when you look at uh, the Japanese standards and uh, the, uh, the European CO2 standards, China is far above uh, your know, standards in Japan and in Europe. So what I want to emphasize from this slide is uh, China has a large potential to reduce not duty vehicle fuel consumption per distance driven. Uh, in fact, that's what we, you know, we did in the last several years. The Energy Foundation began to support the Chinese efforts to evaluate potential fuel consumption status for Chinese vehicles in 2000. So the whole effort starts in 2000, and uh, before that, the Chinese agencies, NDRC, MOST, CEPA, did not even aware of the fact that uh, there are regulations, there are laws in place to, to you know, restrict, uh, to limit fuel consumptions per vehicle. So the whole concept started in 2000 with help from the Energy Foundation. The Energy Foundation put together a domestic research team, including people from different agencies, people from different research institutions, and put together an international expert group to help the Chinese research team to understand uh, you know, what happens you know, outside of China in terms of regulations and what other technologies are available to reduce uh, fuel consumptions. The fuel consumption status was adopted in 2004. So it took four years from the beginning to the end to have emitted to fuel consumption status in place. The phase one fuel consumption status took into effect in July of this year. The phase two status will take into effect in January of 2008. This chart shows you the phase one and the phase two fuel consumption status in China relative to the Japanese uh, fuel consumption status. So one key feature from this chart you see is uh, the Chinese fuel consumption status of your cups you're leaning on the not your model parts. You're for the for the uh, for the not models uh, the status not as uh, strangers as Japanese status. But on the other hand, on the heavy side, the Chinese status are more stranger uh, than the Japanese status. Uh, this show up in this chart. So again, you see phase one and phase two Chinese status. And here in this chart, we put uh, the US 2001 model vehicles into the same chart. And again, for, your, for the not models in the US market, uh, most of the models would meet uh, the Chinese status without much difficulty. But on the other hand, for the heavy models in the, in the U.S. market, namely SUVs and pickup trucks, uh, as you, you can see, those models will have tough time in the Chinese market to meet Chinese status. So in a way, the Chinese status was designed to discourage large vehicles getting into the, you know, the passenger car, passenger vehicle fleet. So SUVs. SUVs. <laughs> okay, got it, got it. This chart shows you the potential carbon savings and oil savings of the adopted uh, fuel consumption status. You know, the, for, the, you know, the first uh, 
the uh, the large green area shows the the carbon savings for the already adopted uh, the so-called M1 vehicle fuel consumption status. And you, as you see from this chart, uh, the adopt status can save about uh, your three. The already adopted status can save about 1.5 million barrels a day of oil by 2030. If we expand the status to, say, the N1 vehicle fleet, uh, namely the freight uh, not duty vehicle fleet, uh, your, their, your vest to move goods and uh, pickups and so on. And furthermore, you expect to heavy duty fleet uh, will, in will, will increase the savings your, by your two times as much as the M1 status. So at that level, we will be able to save three million barrels a day of oil, oil by 2030. At the same time, we will save say, 120, 21 million metric tons of carbon a year in 2030. So the effect is significant. Now, we, uh, your, uh, your cups are alluded to you about uh, the Chinese vehicle model composition versus U.S. Uh, vehicle model composition. As you can see, the green bars here shows the Chinese vehicle composition by adding size, the red, uh, red bar shows the U.S. market uh, share of uh, aging size. You know, as you can see, the trend is called kind of reverse in the two markets. Mm. In the Chinese market, we, ha we have a lot of vehicles with small engines, but on the other hand, in the U.S. market, we have a lot of vehicles with, with large engines. So, the fuel economy or fuel consumption status desired by the Chinese government uh, discourage the, you know, the fleet uh, turn to the, you know, a market similar to the U.S. market. Because as you saw from the previous slides, the status discourage large vehicles. So we hope the status will continue to maintain this type of market, market share. And furthermore, Start last year, Energy Foundation began the efforts to uh, you know, work with government agencies to promote uh, fiscal policies to encourage efficient vehicle technologies, namely smaller vehicles. Specifically, the Chinese government in August adopted a new the so-called vehicle consumption tax scheme. In the past, China, the government has 10% consumption tax cross border for different vehicle, vehicle size. The new scheme is uh, the, consumption, the consumption rate for large duty vehicle fleet uh, will vary from 1% to 20%. Uh, this is consumption rate. This is the rate to the retail price of the vehicles. So on the one hand, for the aging size smaller than one liters, the consumption, the, cons the consumption tax will be 1%. On the other hand, for aging size above four liters, the consumption tax will be 20%. So besides fuel economy status in place, the physical policies adopted in August discourage large vehicles as well. So this is encourage policies to, your, to maintain or even to move vehicle segment further down to the smaller aging size. Now, to the your urban air pollution situation. This chart summarizes 15 cities across the uh, cross, you know, cross world. And uh, you know, unfortunately, the three top cities of this chart are all Chinese cities. So the Chinese urban pollution problem is, is a serious problem. And you know, for those of us who traveled to China, realize that uh, immediately when we get in China. And uh, as you can see, Primarily, right now, the problem is uh, particulate and the sulfur emissions. But gradually, your, in the, the trends in the last uh, several years has shown NAX has become a major urban, urban pollution problem in major US, uh, Chinese cities. And that's because in the last uh, several years, 
they've been uh, tried to move the uh, the cause of the urban air pollution has been moved uh, from the stationary sources to mobile sources. Mm -hmm. So gradually we're going to see NUX and also problems will become a major problem, overcome uh, your especially your SO2 problems in urban air pro area. And the transportation sector will become a large emission source for urban air pollution problems. So in order to deal with the urban air pollution problem, China you know, has adopted strict uh, emission standards. And as you see, in 2000, China began the, the so-called Euro-wide emission standards nationwide. And the Energy Foundation worked with uh, state environment protection agencies in the last uh, several years to promote adoption of Euro, Euro 2 and Euro 3 standards. As you saw, the Euro, Euro 2 standards was in place in 2004, and Euro 3 standards will be in place in 2008. And right now, there are discussions about Euro 4 standards. So we hope, uh, you know, with our international experts' help, uh, working with uh, SIMPA, we hope Euro Euro 4 standards can be adopted uh, maybe around 2010. As you can see on the right side of the slide, fuel quantity has to go along with uh, emission standards. Uh, for example, Euro 3 will require gasoline sulfur contact below 150 ppm. And the Euro 3 diesel emission standards would require diesel sulfur contact below 350 ppm. And if we move to your know, Euro 4, will require sulfur contact below 50 ppm. So this is uh, the demand on fuel quality from emission standards part of fuel. On the other hand, if we look at what, what's the current uh, sulfur contact in the, the Chinese fuels relative to the sulfur contact in Europe and in the US, there is a large gap. So. Right now, we have sulfur contact about 500 ppm for gasoline and diesel. On the other hand, the U.S. sulfur contact now is 30 ppm. And uh, next year, the diesel sulfur contact in the U.S. will be 15 ppm. And the European sulfur contact is about 50 ppm cross board for gasoline and diesel. So there is a large gap in sulfur contact. And we realize this gap, and this could become a bottleneck to implement uh, Euro 3 and Euro 4 emission standards in China. So Energy Foundation realized the bottleneck, realized the urgency to promote no sulfur gasoline and diesel. So we work closely with SIMPA, with uh, local agencies such as Beijing, EP, EPA, to promote uh, the no sulfur gasoline and diesel into the market fast. So we hope by 2020, 20, 10 or 2012, will, uh, China will adopt 50, 50 ppm sulfur gasoline and diesel. And we hope by you know, maybe you know, in the time frame of 2012 to 2015, we'll adopt uh, the so called almost uh, sulfur free gasoline, namely 15 ppm uh, gasoline and diesel. And you know, we have some uh, you know, mechanism to do so. You know, for example, we promote uh, fiscal policies to encourage oil companies to introduce lower sulfur gas and diesel into the market uh, fast. And in fact, uh, Energy Foundation funded a very comprehensive study several years ago to evaluate uh, how Chinese petroleum refin refineries can uh, improve uh, ref refining technologies to achieve you know, lower sulfur gas and diesel. And the study concluded with four sets per gallon of cost for gasoline and diesel, China could implement no sulfur, you know, below 50, 50 ppm sulfur gasoline and diesel cost effectively. So the question now with SIPA and uh, NDRC is uh, how to design some uh, fiscal policies to encourage oil companies to update re Re refinery technologies to produce nor sulfur gasoline and diesel. On the other hand, Doug talked about uh, power generation from coal. 
On the other hand, as we look at the oil supply and demand and the transportation energy supply and demand, China, you know, we all know, has large coal reserve. The reserve is estimated of about 200 billion tons. The resource is about 600 billion tons. The so-called ultimate coal resources could be over, you know, over 1,000 billion tons. So based on the current assumption, which is about 2 billion tons a year, the Chinese reserve can supply the Chinese coal consumption about you know, over 80 years. And of course, the resource is much larger than the reserve. So there is a large incentive in Chinese government to think a way to produce liquid fuels from coal to reduce oil import. Liquid fuels can be produced from coal via the so-called direct liquefaction and indirect liquefaction. With direct liquefaction, it requires higher quantity coal. With indirect liquefaction process via gasification, the liquid fuels can be produced include methanol, diesel, fish charge diesel, and hydrogen. So there are different uh, fuels which can be, can be produced uh, from the indirect uh, liquefaction process. As of now, China produces about 5 million tons of methanol a year. DME production is very small. And there is a plant under construction with 3.2 million tons of oil production a year. This plant will be completed by 2007. And there are some other plants under construction, direct uh, liquefaction plant. So together, it is anticipated by 2010, direct uh, liquefaction plant could produce about <coughs> 10 million tons of oil a year by 2010. And on the other hand, for indirect liquefaction, there are several major projects under cons consideration by the government, by major coal companies, and by some foreign companies with uh, indirect liquefaction technologies. Both direct and indirect liquefaction has lower conversion efficiencies, resu resulting in large amount of carbon emissions during reproduction. Direct liquefactions make carbon capture economically infeasible. On the other hand, indirect liquefaction makes carbon capture and sequestration feasible. Captured carbon could be used for enhanced oil recovery in northwest China, namely in the Ningxia Shaixi province region. So there are some serious consider consideration among coal companies and oil companies to have carbon sequest capture and sequestration in place for oil in enhanced oil recovery in that region. So you know, the approach, a feasible approach in China for carbon capture could be forced to look at some uh, approach to have some economical benefits for carbon capture and sequestration. But in long term, in order to have uh, your carbon sequestration in place, it will require some, some policies for long term carbon capture and sequestration. As Doug as Dan mentioned, your China is your look for the US to, your, to have some policies in place. So this is where uh, your, I see your, some synergies between the two countries. So if US has strong policy in place for carbon capture and sequestration, this will give some uh, your encouragement uh, and some, uh, your, uh, your, some encouragement for the Chinese government to take a step to go to capture, carbon capture and sequestration. So policy-wise, I see some synergy. On the other hand, if the U.S. does not take any action for carbon capture and sequestration, I cannot imagine Chinese government will take the step to do so. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, the direct versus indirect uh, sequestration, the indirect, indirect, uh, sequ uh, the direct uh, liquefaction versus indirect uh, liquefaction. Another synergy for indirect uh, liquefaction is RGCC. RGCC has gasification. 
indirect liquefaction for liquid fuel as gasification. So this is where powered liquid fuel as synergy both share the gasification technology. <coughs> so this may give us a uh, uh, you know, step move forward for your know, core gasification technology in China. A uh, lastly, bus rapid transit. Bus rapid transit three years ago, the Energy Foundation established a bus rapid program to promote BRT, BRT systems in China. And you know, the BRT system has some uh, unique features. It, you know, it has dedicated bus layers so the BRT buses can move fast. It is move your buses from station to station. A uh, bus has large carry capacities you know, in terms of you know, the number of pass passengers to, to carry. For us in Energy Foundation, we promote hybrid electric buses, efficient buses to replace current uh, your dirty, inefficient diesel buses in BRT systems. And as of now, there are 20 cities with five cities you know, in the leading role to uh, seriously evaluate uh, BRT systems in cities. Uh, last year, Beijing opened the first BRT lane from Tiananmen Square to southern, southern suburbans. So this is a new wave in China to promote public transportation system. So earlier I talked about how to manage both vehicle ownership and vehicle usage. So we hope getting into you know, get into the public transportation system to improve the current uh, public transportation system will encourage people to use public transportation system to, you know, to use your private automobiles less. So in a way, you know, we realize uh, your private, private car ownership will go up, but we hope we will we'll reduce the usage of private automobiles. Now back to Doug. Yep. Okay. Doug's both the opening and closing pitcher. <laughs> I think you can see from uh, Michael's presentation, it's really um, bringing the expertise to bear of uh, international uh, experts in China that's making such, um, such rapid headway, particularly in the transportation sector. Um, so this, this chart shows essentially the challenge in a nutshell. Uh, in each of these sectors, there are public policies that lead to commercialization of advanced technologies that can bring China to a low carbon development path. Uh, the challenge, of course, is getting the institutions in place and the personnel capacity in place to bring around uh, this, um, this transition. Next slide. And there's many challenges in the road ahead. Um, the main one really being that uh, China, the chronic understaffing of the, of the Chinese government. And this is why it's so important to bring the Ministry of Finance to bear um, in this uh, discussion to open um, budgets to hire people and get them trained uh, so that the rule of law can emerge at all levels of the Chinese government. Um, there's a lot to say about what is hard, but I think it's more important to begin listening to you about your experiences and what you're finding to be challenging in China. Um, but the bottom line here, um, how the U.S. adapts to China's peaceful rise, to China's peaceful ascendancy, um, will be the biggest challenge, really, of this century. Um, and I think we need to encourage a broad tent as a bottom line. Um, inviting China to the table as a partner, engage in the G8, and so on. We can view this as much as a constraint, as an award, but it's certainly an, an acknowledgement of the inevitable. Uh, and finally, final point really is the United States must lead. Um, we can't expect, you know, a relatively poor developing country that's new to a market economy to automatically know how to do all this stuff. You know, we have to engage and be directly involved in the capacity building around the institutions so that China adopts a low carbon path. But that begins at home with the United States it has to adopt carbon policy. Uh, 
And if we don't, we're going to be left behind in this century because it is those technologies that will be the largest market in the, 20th in the 21st century. And we need to be on board to innovate those technologies. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I need to ask my interns, um, Charlotte and Lyndon, to grab the microphones because, um, and we'll start with Ruth. So, Lyndon, can you hand it to Ruth right behind you? There's a mic over there. And um, so I'll take your names and I'll do numbers and <laughs> okay. Okay. Keep your hand up until I point at you. So then, one, two, three. Okay. Lyndon, give it to her and then, okay. Hi, I'm Ruth Bell from Resources for the Future. Um, I want to put another possible, Barbara. <laughs> Another possible issue that could be a challenge on the table, which is uh, as we contemplate uh, China as an energy consumer and an environmental actor, which is China's impact in the countries where it increasingly is becoming important and may become dominant in an extraction of, um, of uh, you know, coal and whatever, all these, all these minerals and things. I was in Mongolia this summer, and it's pretty clear that China is having a pretty negative impact on that country environmentally. Um, it's using the resources, you know, Ch Mongolia, that's what it principally has to offer into the world. So I didn't know whether anybody's sort of giving some thought to, you know, how that's going to work because China's environmental impact is going to be well beyond its own borders and not just because of things like air pollution. It's a very important point. Do, do, do others have um, thoughts yeah. about that? Jeff, Jeff yes. raise your hand so she knows to bring the mic to you. Lyndon, pass it to Jeff Logan, please. Raise your hand, Jeff. So you she for another question? Yeah. Do you want to comment or question? You want to make a comment? Well, you know, EPA here would be a great, uh, some folks here to comment on that. I mean, you know, it's one of the problems here, obviously, is dumbing down environmental regulations <laughs> around the world. And uh, we've got to get WTO and so on. Uh, have it be part of that institution to be, you know, rap ratcheting up the environmental standards in well, other countries. Exactly right. It's not just coming down to this. Actually, Mongolia, which is my example, has environmental laws on the books, but like most places, it isn't, com it isn't, isn't causing any compliance, it isn't right. enforcing, and so it's just right. sitting right. there while this is taking place. So I think it's well beyond laws. Most, most countries already have laws. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me comment on uh, your that question. I think your your I see your what uh, your what you mentioned is your great example. Your Mongolia and China just next to each other, as your some of the air pollutants just your transport to Mongolia. I imagine you know, that's the case. Though your your if you your see the climate condition maybe less because the wind cuts you from west to east. As you, as uh, many of us in this room know, we see some observations that uh, your farm particles from China c <laughs> carry all the way to uh, to the uh, to the U.S. Mm -hmm. So even for your air pollution, it's a global. It's increase increasingly become a global problem. Not even said your CO two is a global problem. So ho hope your different countries work together to promote. Uh, Clean technologies, you know, that's uh, you know, that's a key issue, and I think your know, China, your know, other other had your know, other one had China look for countries, U.S., Japan, Europe, uh, to look at your know, experience and your know, positive negative experience to learn your know, how China can do things in a better way. On the other hand, China could set a good example for other developed countries like Mongolia, like Southeast Asia, and other countries as an example to a sustainable pathway. So you know, it goes both ways for China to learn from others and to set examples for your know, other countries. Good. Jeff, your question? Uh, or thanks for thank you for giving me the chance to uh, ask a question. It's great to see um, so many people here with so many different interests. and. Um, uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, first, thank you to Doug and Michael for great um, and solid presentations. Um, I, went, I had one question and one observation. Um, the Energy Foundation has been working in China for uh, about eight years, and they're acknowledged for carrying out very innovative and creative projects. And uh, I was just wondering, Doug, if you had perhaps three lessons that you've learned uh, in those eight years working in China what works, what doesn't work, how, how do you, you think your policies will, will progress in the future, perhaps? 
Um, and, and my observation is something that both Michael and Doug said, that U.S. leadership is critical in order to engage China. And unless the U.S. is able to um, act, I think, as an independent leader first itself, then the Chinese, unless it does that, the Chinese will not be able to take us seriously on either climate issues or energy security issues. And I'm, I'm especially thinking of the oil security example. Um, you know, the U.S. is telling China not to invest in, in rogue states, yet, yet our policy is, is, is fairly muddled, I think. We, we, our U.S. Congress prevents China from, for example, buying Unical or the um, U.S. policy incur uh, tries to discourage natural gas pipelines that would travel through unstable states in South Asia, for example. The U.S. policy does very little to try to promote energy uh, exchange between Russia and China. And all of those things, I think, if taken, if addressed carefully, would end up uh, providing greater energy security for, for this country. And we end up uh, do, shooting ourselves in the foot by, um, I think, by not thinking carefully and acting strongly on, on what our best interests might be. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Well, in and, uh, and Jeff, I'll, you can pass the mic to the gentleman straight across from you. I'll try to respond to um, the three lessons. Um, and it's just off the top of my head. I think the first, I mean, we've engaged um, the central government and then <coughs> governors at the provincial level and mayors at the local level. I think it's very important to, in, you know, be very transparent with the program and engage senior individuals um, and, and, and to nurture champions. You know, for example, on the fuel economy standard, uh, I was one of our senior policy advisory members who then chaired the steering committee where we brought in then the, the, the research community and fed in the, the policy analysis that led to the design then of China's fuel economy standards. But that individual became a champion in the process within the central government to move this thing forward. So um, nurture champions would be one, one lesson. Um, second of all, y you know, it's really who is the best messenger of policy analysis, um, you know, who has the most credibility within the central government, within the provincial government, the local government, um, so that those champions have a credible, uh, credible analysis on which to build public policy. Uh, one of the big challenges here, of course, is data and, and, and watertight data. And uh, so China's statistics and improvement in, in China's statistics needs to be pretty fundamental um, as they build a, a policy, uh, an energy policy um, analytic infrastructure. Um, and the third lesson really is scale. Um, we've had the luxury of great funding partners who are sticking with us. Um, and we've tried to develop this or, or, or create this program as a partnership so that more partners can join um, and so that this can be uh, an avenue to to helping countries build or helping China build capacity uh, around new new sustainable energy policies. Um, you know, when Ruth was making the point earlier, earlier about Mongolia, it's a little presumptuous to me to say that hey, we've got a great thing going here. We, we certainly don't have everything right. But shouldn't the United States foreign policy involve programs like this in every country? I mean, every country has to be moving to a low carbon path. Every country has to be developing the environmental regulations so that pollution is expensive and incentives so that the clean technologies are, are comparatively cheap. That infrastructure has to be built everywhere, and it should be a centerpiece of U.S. foreign policy. Nick Lardy? Uh, my question is uh, for either or both. Um, on. Um, you, you both touched on uh, the new fuel economy standards that have been introduced, and there was a mention also of the consumption tax based on engine size, which is really a sales tax, and it's going to be ratcheted up so it's even uh, more steeply uh, penalizing uh, the, the larger engines. But you, none, neither of you said anything about the energy price uh, pass-through problem that China has recently yeah. mm -hmm. uh, fallen into, and it seems so uh, contrary to what they're doing on progressive steps in other other areas. I'm wondering if you think 
what what's the cause of this and is there uh, likely to be any movement uh, going forward? I mean, it seems like such a conflict. They're doing the right things in two areas, but in one area they're just missing missing it completely. Maybe yeah, the yeah I agree. The yeah, the yeah, the energy price area is, yeah, okay. has not been catch up with the intention of energy conservation because uh, the energy price affect uh, your know, everybody's uh, your life. So the the government is very cautious to uh, your know, raise the price that your know, suddenly generates a social problem. So the government has been very cautious to uh, move forward to uh, you know, for electricity price for fuel price. For fuel price, there have been uh, your know, several years of discussion to move from the so-called vehicle registration fee to uh, your fuel tax, like the U.S. system, you, you have uh, your tax, you have fuel tax to uh, support transportation instead of vehicle registration. Because you know, we believe, Energy Foundation believe if uh, you know, the country move from vehicle registration fee to fuel tax, uh, there will be an incentive to reduce vehicle usage because we you know, move from uh, your uh, year, your annual fixed cost uh, to per mile fixed cost. Uh, economical theory says that people will react uh, to to be conscious how much they you know, they want to drive. So we've been promoting that, uh, and the government, uh, you know, the government's position is you know, they want to wait for the right opportunity to to you know, do that switch. Right now, the gas price is already high, so they feel it's not the right time to create another social problem suddenly from vehicle registration to fuel to fuel tax. So you know, the you know, the decision is in place, and uh, as uh, as we know, they're you know, they're said they're waiting for the right timing, and I do not know if the right timing will ever you know, arrive because uh, the crew the price keep going up and up. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's the problem. So and Nick, yeah, I mean, but you're absolutely right. This pass through problem, I mean, because consumers still only are seeing about what about a dollar fifty a gallon, despite very high oil prices. So consumers are not seeing this. My sense and conversations uh, have been, you know, they're just very concerned about um, social stability. They're moving 300 million from the rural countryside into cities and so on. So there's a, just a lot in flux, and there, there's all these demonstrations happening in, in the main cities because as people are moved from the state sector into private jobs, I mean, they just don't want to add fuel to a potential fire. Um, we have been working, you know, on, on you know, the fuel taxes, as, as Michael's been saying. Um, one of the analysis, you know, we're trying to help them retrofit refineries for low sulfur fuel. A four cent gas tax would, would help them do that. We've been working on the utility tariffs. They had, they did just put through some tariff reform uh, there, which will raise consumer prices slightly, but it's not as far as we want them to be going. But it is a little more cost reflective. It's going to be a gradual process. Okay, right here. Yeah, Alulu from EIA. Well, first, I would like to thank you for very insightful presentations. Uh, so having said that, I have a couple of comments. Sure. So even though, uh, you know, as analyst, uh, there is easy way to mm -hmm. dramatize things, to make a point. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though I agree with you both about the trends, the trends when, when it comes to China, energy, it's alarming. And the consequence of these trends are alarming. But the solution that you're suggesting, or many the other organizations are suggesting, sometimes it's a debatable. And my point is that uh, when we look at our model at EIA, China can go middle ground instead of jumping to the clean coal technology that even in the U.S. are not really you know, investing heavily in it. So my view that even when I look at what the numbers they're using, like oil growth in 2004 is 18%. Well, in 2005, the half, first half was like 3 or 4%. So that shows that it depends what kind of growth rate you'd like to project to make your point. Sure. I would say that no, they are really making something in 2005. Mm -hmm. The other issue about the oil uh, consumption and forecast to the year 2025, I saw in one of your slides you're using uh, IEA, our you know, publication uh, mm -hmm. source 2004, and mm -hmm. you are showing 14.2 mil million, uh, million uh, barrels per day. Actually, this is the 2005. Because if you look at 2004, okay. we have 12.7. And okay. we revised because we felt that when you look okay. at the economic growth, 6.1%, 4.1% in 
from 2003 till, till 2025, it really will reflect on your oil demand forecast. So my view we'll that, when, that <laughs> yeah, when you look at uh, the middle ground, you can look at the energy. And even right now, NDRC and many other organizations are looking and say, look, we know that most of us who are in dealing with energy in, the, uh, in China are engineers. So it's very easy to fill the trap that let's really believe in the technology. But they said, well, look, you know, LNG can really meet our demand, and it's less polluting than oil, less polluting than coal, and it will balance the uh, long uh, outlook for the U.S. Uh, for the China energy. Yeah. No. Okay. Well, I think we, I think we agree. I mean, we're trying everything we can to encourage a leapfrog to the cleanest energies now. I mean, in its energy investment. Uh, energy s efficiency investment in, in, you know, demand on the demand side, you know, that we're really encouraging through this. So thank you for your comments. Okay, J Jeremy, Julie, and then the two folks against the wall, and then you. Okay. <laughs> and so quick questions or comments, please. Okay. Uh, Jeremy Schreifel <laughs> from, Jeremy Schreifel from US EPA. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thanks for the presentations, and um, rather than a question, I'd like to kind of share some of the challenges that we've faced uh, in response to your request. And we're working on air quality programs primarily in the power sector, working with both SEPA as well as some of the EPBs. Yeah. And we're facing some of the obvious challenges, you know, limited enforcement, um, data problems all along. But I think another, you know, one of the more important issues that we're facing today is we're seeing the focus is on the city level, so air quality within the cities. And a lot of the slides that you showed here today also focused on that. And while it's important that we try to address, um, try to address the emissions within the cities, we also have to look at the broader region because <coughs> you can't solve the problem just with a city focus. Mm -hmm. And to that, to that end, we're starting to work more on uh, regional air quality management. But in, in trying to do that, We've, we're finding very little cooperation between the provinces, and there's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's almost impossible to get something, uh, to move something forward. Now, SEPA is starting to work on that uh, with these environmental plans in the three, the three key regions in the Bohai, uh, Yangtze River Delta, and uh, Pearl River Delta. But at the same time, while they're moving forward, a, as you pointed out, they have, what is it, 283 staff members? Mm -hmm. So it's not sufficient to really move forward with these programs. And so that's, um, you know, that's where we're starting to focus our efforts. And we're actually hosting a conference at the end of this month in Beijing focused on regional air quality management Great. and sure. trying to bring in people from the relevant provinces and cities <coughs> to talk about the experiences in both Europe and the U.S. and how we can transfer some of those lessons to the Chinese context. Excellent. Okay. Well, that's um, it's really important. We'll, we want to work with you on that. Um, one of the things that, you know, the State Electricity Regulatory Commission is now also setting up regional, you know, branches. Um, and uh, so we're involved in training those commissioners. Still, those are, again, without pricing authority, this is a relatively weak entity. But in time, we hope to also have the electricity infrastructure on a more regional basis and encouraging efficiency and renewables investments regionally as the grids begin to tie together. And SEPA is also setting up regional offices, but they have no staff. Yeah. Well, yeah. There you have it. Get that, minister, <laughs> get that Ministry of Finance to open up those purse strings. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, I thank you for the very clearly laid out challenges and opportunities in, in China's energy, energy uh, uh, area. I have two uh, major questions. The first one is uh, uh, that there seems to be two major groups of economic uh, forecasts right now. Uh, one group is fairly rosy about uh, China's economic growth. The other one, um, a lot of them coming from uh, China's um, own economists, seem to be a lot more negative, uh, concerned about a potential collapse in, in the economic growth path. Um, so given your knowledge about uh, China's energy challenges, I was wondering if uh, you believe that you know, I, I, is that a possibility? You know, what in what situation perhaps China's economy may collapse due to economic uh, energy and resource issues? Um, and uh, what's what are the implications for the world economy? Uh, the second question is uh, related to the transportation area, where 
Um, I believe that China is using ethanol uh, in, um, uh, in its mix uh, with uh, uh, gasoline for uh, passenger cars. And uh, what, what about uh, biodiesel? Uh, China is a huge uh, agricultural producer, uh, tons of uh, grain, uh, grain production, and uh, how about using biodiesel? And I believe there is some interest in China in, in doing that. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about the, that area? Good. And can you pass the mic to the woman next to you? Okay, Doug. Do you want to do Michael. biodiesel first? <laughs> maybe, uh, yeah, let me comment on uh, uh, the uh, economic growth projection. I think you know, if we look at uh, the Chinese projection as well, they're not that uh, pessimistic as well. They, you know, their project, uh, you know, they're going to uh, you know, double the economy by 2020 again, or actually quadrupled from 2000 to 2020. So we talk about uh, annual growth rate, rate of, of uh, about 8%. So that's not pessimistic relative to our your annual growth rate. rate. As, you know, as uh, for whether your know, environmental energy issues will you know, cause the economical crap, uh, I have not seen historically uh, that has been a problem in other countries, except uh, say the uh, oil price in the uh, 70s did cause recession. recession. So if, uh, you know, if China, your know, oil price high enough cause recession, that's you know, considerable. But I think more so it's you know, some other factors cause uh, economical clap uh, you know, instead of a recession. And you know, to the transportation questions, right now there are eight provinces to have demonstration programs to uh, blend ethanol into gasoline 10% as we do here. And the ethanol is produced uh, from corn in China. As you can see with uh, 1.3 billion people, I have your I have uh, your expressed my opinion many times to NDRC your which promote uh, ethanol as a uh, fuel. Your my opinion is your with that uh, large of population with limited uh, your far farming land I cannot see your corn ethanol can play anything significant in China. So you, you will be your even more limited the U.S. corn ethanol role. And we, you know, we know the corn ethanol in the U.S. market is pretty limited itself. As for biodiesel, biodiesel the problem is right now we produce biodiesel from soybean. As your U.S. has soybean surplus, China does not have soybean surplus. There are some of uh, your discussions to produce biodiesel from wasted oil, like say, cook oil and so on, and some new vegetations. So there are some research programs going on in China now. But you know, in terms of you know, whether those new vegetations generate uh, some of your, your oil containing seed for biodiesel production, that as far as I know, still at uh, the R D stage. So I am less your know, hopeful for biodiesel than for ethanol. For ethanol, I think the uh, your, your including myself, many believe the potential is in cellulosic ethanol. So if uh, we your know, develop cellulosic technology your know, fast enough that your know, to produce ethanol from trees, grass, that has a big potential in the US and in China. Related to this, but just tangential, but just this weekend there was a, a renewable energy um, demonstration in Tacoma Park and they had a tofu powered lawnmower. <laughs> I just thought I'd mention that. I mean, it's not an option because of the China food issue, but I just <laughs> thought that was really amazing and it made me want to go eat some tofu. Julie. Um, Julie Walton with the U.S. China Business Council. Um, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on how you are working with uh, foreign investors in China to address energy efficiency problems or um, energy efficiency demand, uh, demands for energy efficient technologies. A lot of U.S. companies are really very interested in selling their technologies and many Chinese regulators have commented on how they prefer U.S. technology in this area and yet it is Chinese domestic policies on many levels that prevent U.S. companies from actually selling their more efficient, better um, better manufactured products. I think a good example would be the new wind farm in the Bohai region where they're going to require 70% local content requirements will basically exclude U.S. Um, manufacturers from participating and selling better, more efficient, energy efficient products. So I, I'm, I'm curious if you work with U.S. companies um, in your organization or how you communicate their views in developing energy efficiency programs. 
Well, obviously, the Chinese are very interested in technology transfer. And as you're describing, the local content rules are, are aimed at encouraging the transfer of, of technology as quickly as possible. Um, you know, we, at the end of the day, we're trying to get, our, our, we're an environmental organization. We're trying to clean up the air, we're trying to improve public health, and we're trying to get investment regardless of source into energy efficiency and renewable energy technology. Where we feel that commercialization can be ramped up more rapidly and that it's in China's best interests uh, to have lower domestic content requirements and to encourage foreign investment, uh, you, you know, in these technologies, which is in most of these areas. Um, we have those discussions. Um, I talk with a, a lot of um, folks in the, um, you know, that are doing business in China. I hear about what's hard for them. Um, because we're, in, we're engaged in public policy, that the, all of those discussions are on the table on how best to shape those policies. Um, to encourage the most rapid volume um, development of these technologies in China to bring unit costs down. So um, we're open to those things. Um. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, let me quickly comment. I share with uh, your comment and what uh, Doug said. On the other hand, there are some encour encouraging indications in the transportation area. Now the government uh, tried to develop policy to encourage hybrid electric vehicles introduction into the Chinese market. As we know, you know right now is Toyota and uh, some other companies has the technology. So there are some indications that the government starts to pay attention to energy efficient technologies, give some better treatment to those technologies get into the market pro marketplace. But I, I think your uh, major issue is the RP related issues. For your some of the technologies companies are concerned about RP protections, you know, whether China will have enough protection so the com so the companies would uh, you know, move into the Chinese market. That's a broad issue. I do not yeah, I think you your the area I share with you is uh, it is pessimistic to see your now in terms of uh, your sending policies to attract investment still primarily for economic reasons. Environment efficient energy efficiency are secondary, if any, yeah, in the whole decision making process. So I, you know, I hope in the future the government will pay more attention to these two aspects uh, in uh, your certain policy making process to encourage uh, your foreign investment. Okay, we're going to finish up. We're going to have Mark, the gentleman in the white T-shirt under Woodrow Wilson, and then Doug. And sorry, which, and then you guys can tackle him afterwards, these guys. But Mark, uh, Mark Schaefer with NatureServe. Uh, obviously, with energy development at the scale that that you're talking about, uh, you not only have major emissions-related uh, challenges, uh, uh, carbon emissions and other pollutants, but you're also I don't think this thing. Oh, it does. Oh, you got to get closer. Sorry. Okay. But, but you also have major issues associated with just rearranging the landscape and, and questions about uh, where you locate roads, where you locate power plants, uh, transmission lines, and so on. And I'm wondering, to what degree does your program, your sustainable energy program, I guess, Doug, this is a question for you, uh, actually look at some of these broader uh, landscape scale issues? Not much. At this point, you know, it's really uh, we're we're focused more on investment flows, um, and just getting these policies in place for these particular kinds of technologies. We're a te technology policy shop. Um, I understand the importance of land use and and siting issues. Um, when it comes to siting issues, we're mostly talking about hey, let's get the least cost energy resource in place that has the the, the least impactful footprint. Um, nevertheless, there's a lot of infrastructure that China's building very quickly. And they, you know, for example, the, 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 large, the, the large wind resources uh, require transmission lines um, to tap those and get those to population centers. Um, we do talk about how best to, to go about doing transmission um, and emphasizing distributed generation, putting the technology as close to the load center as possible. That 
you know, reduces land impacts and so on. Um, so I think we're mindful, um, but we can always use help in that area. There, yeah. there are some organizations that are doing work. They, they partner with certain cities and try to do, they're like urban planning type mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. But I, I think you did highlight what I've also seen as kind of a gap. Okay, yeah. sir? Yeah. Oh, just a couple of quick questions. Um, I was wondering, China has moved very quickly to become a dominant player in the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism Market. But recently the Chinese government has, has shown uh, indication that they may want to tax the carbon credits, the, the revenue stream coming out of this. So I was wondering if your organization is working on this issue of CDM and carbon credits, and because I, this, I would think, would discourage the innovative developers who are trying to put in place low-carbon projects. And the second question I had was about India. I mean, you briefly mentioned India as, some, as a country that's following China in many of the trends, energy demand, pollution, and so on and so forth. Does your organization have a similar a plan for a project or program in India? Because to me, it looks like you know they have similarities, yet there are differences in terms of being a democracy and having a more tortuous, uh, convoluted policy process, and also being a more of a service economy than the Chinese economy. At least that's the plan. You know, they mm -hmm. want to go in right, terms of right. outsourcing. So, well, let me m m answer the latter first. Um, if we had a funding partner that was interested in India, we would launch an India program. And it's, it, this is it's a key player in this century. Uh, we absolutely have to be involved in encouraging efficiency and renewable energy in, in India. So if any of you know a major funder out there, uh, <laughs> to, to, uh, please talk to me. Um, regarding CDM, our focus really has been on least cost, no regrets options, and less so on CDM and, and carbon credits. Uh, in that whole regime. There's a lot of very capable minds and attention to CDM. Uh, we haven't felt a need to be in that space. Okay. And the closer is Doug Murray? Well, but this is the last one. I'll yeah. Oh, can you get the microphone? Sorry. Yeah, well, well. Sorry. <laughs> yeah I appreciate it. Because we're webcasting, that's why we need the microphone today. Sure. Thanks. I'll finish with a softball question, but first to say those were terrific presentations, and thank you. Thanks. Uh, the softball question is basically following up on your observations that the U.S. has to take some leads on some of these key issues. I guess I'm not wildly optimistic that we're well positioned to do that right now. Uh, but there is a feedback question. Your programs are essentially addressing China's problems. And yet there are some areas that you've touched on today where Americans have said, gee, that's interesting, like cafe, stand cafe type standards, taxation on engine size, and so on. General question is, in all of this work, have you or, or anyone here sensed any feedback into the U.S. where programs and people here are saying, we ought to be paying attention to that. Gee, if they can do it, maybe we could do it. I'd be very interested in others' um, perspective on that question. So let's open it up to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. Well, I mean, that, that is actually one reason why I dragged Doug out here kicking and screaming from the West Coast. <laughs> Two, you know, to, to get this issue out there, and, and I will be, um, the China Environment Forum, we will be holding more, e more meetings on China's energy and trying to, trying to have a balanced discussion um, not because, as you know, in, in Washington there has been a lot of talk of, of vilifying the Chinese for going out and getting oil concessions in other countries and things. And so I think that, we, I mean, I'll do my best that I can, Doug, <laughs> to try to get the dialogue going and hopefully um, organizing some, taking some speakers up to the Hill as well to chat with those folks. And I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of your questions, but these guys are within tackleable range. But I need to say, because everyone else did already, stellar presentation, very clear, and let's applaud one more time. <laughs>